Matthew chapter 4. We, uh, we finished off last year um, having got to the end of Matthew 3, so obviously we're picking up in Matthew chapter 4 now. Um, this week, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> this week we are um, going to, rather than deal with all 11 verses, it will take us a few weeks to get through this, I want to just really give us a uh, a foundation, as it were, um, firstly to build and look at the specifics of this passage, the very famous temptation of Christ, um, and secondly just to see how it fits into the whole span and spectrum of Matthew's Gospel. Um, for those of you who are newer, one of the things that we really try and do here as we're teaching through a gospel is we don't want to just sort of throw all of the gospel parallels together, but really we want to know what, what is Matthew saying? What is his emphasis? Why has he done what he's done, said what he said, the way that he said it, in the order that he said it, and so on and so forth? So. Let's then look at the text and see how we come to Matthew 4. Um, we finished Matthew 3 with the baptism of Jesus. God, uh, the Father from heaven, pronounces at the end there of chapter 3, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we spoke about how Matthew chapter 1 begins with the sonship, the son of David, the son of Abraham, uh, and then it ends with sonship at the end of chapter 3. The chapter 1 to 3 is sort of almost set aside as being um, the introduction to the life of Christ, the birth of Christ, the foundation of Christ. And now that the Father has spoken this way concerning the Son, now that the Spirit has come upon the Son, then now then is the time for ministry. John the Baptist has prepared the way with his baptism of repentance, that Jesus has been baptized by John to associate himself with the people of God, with this this understanding of God and his words in a way that is distinct from the Pharisees of the day. And now the ministry begins. And the ministry begins with chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus being led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. This passage, and again, we won't cover it all today, we'll um, we're going to sort of look at more of an outline today, but this passage is one that has been very misunderstood over the years, and um, I want us to kind of get the main things that are going on today. And I think that the first and most important thing for us to grasp as we come to it today is that the ministry of Christ began with a time of testing, a time of testing. If you think that you can serve God without a time of testing, then you are placing yourself above Jesus Christ. It simply won't ever happen. And every single one of us has a ministry. We are firm believers here at this church that every one of us is a minister, that my job is not minister, my job is equipper. I am here to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That every one of us who are saved, saints of God, are ministers. That we've all been equipped by the Holy Spirit through the power of the Word to do ministry that God has uniquely chosen and equipped us to do. Every experience of our lives, every trial that we've been through, every pain that we've endured, every circumstance to do with our background, everything comes together by the sovereign hand of God that he would use us in ways that he will not use any other. There is no greater value of a human being than there is in church. That every single one of us, whether we are young or old, in years or in faith, whether we have stumbled and struggled, whether we have excelled and soared, 
whoever we are, we are ministers. And God has a plan and a purpose to use us, and he equips us for that purpose. One of the greatest tragedies of the Christian church today is the shallow, self-centered, uh, soundbite type of Christianity with teaching that at best is milky and has no real meat to it. And as a result, people don't grow up in faith. And as a result, they don't get to minister as they can and as they should. But here in the text, in verse 1, there is this reminder to us that ministry, that effective ministry, begins with trials and with temptation. God has declared, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Well, let's find out. And for many of us, there are times and moments where we say, okay, this is, this is my life now. I hope that for many of us last Sunday as we started the new year and we had a kind of one-off sermon in that regard, that we were again encouraged just to, to gird the loins, as Scripture says, and just to pull ourselves up and say, okay, by your power and your strength and your might, I will serve you. I will treasure you. And then maybe it was Monday, maybe it was Tuesday, maybe it was Sunday afternoon, but you're tested again. A am I going to be what I have declared that I am, that I shall be, that I will do? And the Father has made a declaration about the Son, and we in this passage <clears throat> are going to see that the Son is who the Father has declared him to be. And for any one of us, who we are and what we are declared to be by others or by ourselves is only really found out in the practicalities of life. You can say, I love my spouse, but if you treat them a certain way, then your words don't match up with your life. And equally, we can say, I love Jesus. And Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. And so there is a test to see if what is declared is true in practice. And so Jesus is going to be tested. Now, Brian read through the entirety of this passage for us, so we're reminded again if it's been a while since we've seen it and read it, but you'll see the outline uh, here that the first testing is with regards to food, then there is the testing with regards to um, the angels uh, protecting him, and then there is the testing with regards to worshipping of God at the end, a test ultimately with regards to idolatry and, and shortcuts. And it will go through these in detail in the coming weeks, but for now I want us to simply note that each one of these tests is a test about trusting in God. It's a test about trusting in God. You know, we speak about the Bible and we teach the Bible in great depth here. But at the same point, I like to think that we emphasize the basics clearly and simply again and again and again and again. I, I want to make sure that when you come to church each week, you're learning new things, even if you've been in the faith for a while. And I'm not so naive as to not realize and expect that large amounts of what you hear new, you're going to forget by the time you come back the following week. And that's why we, each week as we go through the text, we say, I remember last time we did this, and then we just try and remind you. But there are certain things that have to be emphasized again and again and again and again. And whether you are sort of, you know, at the end of your life or whether you're a child, that there is, that there is the basics that are just emphasized so clearly and so repetitively that you know that these are the main things. And let me say this very, very clearly. What, one of the most main things that we want to proclaim at this church is that we are people of faith, and our faith is seen in our trusting in God. 
We do not see faith as being us just simply saying, oh, well, I kind of believe this. I intellectually agree with this. You cannot say you have faith in Christ and then live your life like you don't trust him. You've got to trust God. That is the most basic thing of what faith is. And as I said last week, it grieves me the damage that has been caused where we have whittled down the definition of faith to simply mean I intellectually accept and agree something that happened 2,000 years ago. That is not the entirety of what faith is. It means trusting in him. It means trusting in his path, in his way. Is Jesus capable of turning stones into bread? Of course he is. He's God. But he trusts that God's path for him is a path that God has placed him on for a purpose, a path that God has placed him on and will carry him through. When you're first a Christian, I imagine that every prayer that you pray, for many at least, is a God, please make this better kind of prayer. Hey God, I'm struggling with this. Can you make it better? Hey God, things aren't great at work. Can you make it better? Hey God, things are tricky at home right now. Can you make it better? Hey God, I'm really not enjoying this part of my life. Can you make it better? And, and for some of us, even after years in the faith, the little that we pray can be summarized in that simple phrase, God, please make things better. And we live naively thinking that God is somehow there to look after us, that the world revolves around us, that we are the centerpiece in creation and that God exists to serve us rather than the other way around. And God, please make my life better. Please make things work out. Please take away my pain. Please take away my trials. Please take away my struggles. And yet here with Christ, we see him, even at the beginning, even with the, the bread, uh, the, the temptation to turn the stones into bread, that there is, this, there is this absolute trust in the Father that is separate from us having a comfortable and cozy existence. And this is seen as we go into the, the second verse. We'll come back to aspects of verse 1 in a minute. When it says he had fasted 40 days and nights and he then became hungry. The, the legacy um, Bible which we have in our pew Bibles here is, is a really good translation that just clarifies what the Greek is doing here. And, and it says... He then became hungry. The Greek is emphatic on this point. It's not that he was hungry after day two or day three and he continued to be hungry, but he got to day 40 and then he was hungry. And I have to say that reading through commentaries this week, the naivety in the, amongst the commentators, the ignorance on this point, just simply shows how little anybody does any fasting these days. Um, let, me, let me give you a little bit of background as to what happens here. If you were to start fasting today, like you go out from church and you don't eat anything, maybe you can have some snacks, we've got snacks after, have the snacks first, and then you go home and you start fasting, okay? And, and fasting here in its normal usage would have meant you can have water, you drink as much water as you like, but there's no calories, you don't eat any food, that you simply are living off water. And you would go home if you didn't eat anything else today, and by bedtime you'd be pretty uncomfortable. Tomorrow would be, quite frankly, miserable. Most of us aren't used to going without a meal. Some of us struggle to miss having a snack between meals. And if we go for a day or you know, a full day without food, man, we are going to be one cranky person by the end of that day. You hit day two, still pretty unpleasant, but the crankiness can actually start to go. And once you're in day three and day four, something absolutely astonishing happens. You don't expect this because 
we just don't do this much, so we don't really know about this. But you stop being hungry. Now, that isn't to say that you don't walk down the road and get a whiff of freshly baked bread outside of the bakery and go, oh, I'd love some bread. It doesn't mean to say that you, 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 have, you see somebody else cooking a meal and you say, oh, I wish I could eat some of that. It doesn't mean to say that you see somebody eating something on the streets and you think, man, I'd love to eat that. It doesn't mean to say that shopping for groceries for the rest of your family doesn't create temptation. But it means to say that the, that, that urge of hunger has actually now passed. It's an astonishing thing. If you've never done it, I think you should. Everybody should do it at least once in their lives. To get to that point of fasting where the, the immediate craving, oh my goodness, I have to eat, now I'm starving, just goes. It disappears, it's gone. Day four, day five, day six, day seven, day eight, day nine, day ten, you're not hungry. You might want food, but you're not hungry. And then, at a certain point, and the body's a remarkable thing. The body will, will do what's called autophagy, which is, just means eating itself. <laughs> you, you have an astonishing amount of nutrients within you, in your fat, in your muscles, and the body eats itself away. And actually, scientists today are starting to recognize how good fasting is for your health. Some scientists will claim that it can cure cancer and all sorts of other diseases. Why? Because when the body starts to eat itself, it gets rid of the, the least essential parts first. Your heart doesn't start to get eaten, your brain doesn't start to get eaten, but that muffin top that sits around your waist does. The, the muscles that you don't use start to get eaten up. In some cases, researchers have found that even things like tumors start to get eaten up as well. The fasting is a remarkable thing. But at some point, at some point, you run out of fat. For some of us, that might be hundreds of days. But if you are slim, healthy, and in good shape, without too much excess fat on you, and you were to fast, you will find that after approximately 40 days, you will run out of fuel. And at that point, whether you're super skinny and it's less than 40 days, whether you're carrying a bit of excess and it's way more than 100 days, at some point when you run out of fuel, of the non-essentials, do you know what your body does? to say, hold on a second, you're about to lose your heart, you're about to lose your livers, you're about to lose your kidneys. The things that you need are about to be eaten to keep you alive. You get hungry again. What the text is telling us is that Jesus got to the point where he had no excess left and the body turned on hunger again. And it, when it comes on again, it comes on with an astonishing urgency. And if you study those doctors that use fasting as various methods of healing and what have you, every single one of them will agree. The second that hunger switch goes back on again, you have to eat because you're about to kill yourself if you don't. <coughs> so Jesus in his 40 days, it's not saying that, oh boy, you know, he's not eating for a while, he must be really hungry. It's, it's actually recognizing something that we know scientifically, which is that Jesus got to the point of absolute skinniness, where there was no excess fat, where his muscles, you know, his leg muscles, his arm muscles had been kind of taken right down to the bare bones. He was pretty much skin and bones. And if he was going to keep going, the, at that point, he was going to be literally eating away his essential organs. And there would have been a hunger that had come upon him that was a hunger that probably most of us will never experience. I've done several periods of, of extended fasting in my life. I've been over 30 days twice, and I never got close to this point. 
and you have to be looking like, you know, you know, absolutely nothing, like, like at the point of death. Can you just imagine what our Lord would have been like? Have you ever seen the pictures of those kind of Auschwitz victims at the point? You know, just, just ribs, just sticking out, no fat, no muscle, just absolutely at the point of starving to death. That's what Jesus looked like in the wilderness. Nothing of him. So when the tempter comes in verse 3 and says, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. We need to understand this is not, I haven't eaten for a while, I might be a little bit hungry kind of temptation. But this is a person who is going to literally die. Who is so weak they can barely walk. Who has no muscles left and cannot really function who is living alone in the wilderness and it's like are you really the son of God? Now see how this follows end of chapter 3? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Are you really a son of God? Because if you are then there's something that's going to have to be true of you for the prophecies concerning the son to be fulfilled and that one of the thing that has to be true is that you have to be alive you're just gonna, you're just gonna the die here that's what's gonna happen if you really are the son then you're able to keep yourself alive by feeding yourself as the years go by I've been a Christian for you know I'm coming up to 40 years of being a Christian in the next year or two and as the years and the decades go by it just, it just astonishes me how much Christianity has become a cultural thing that, that we're just, we just do church, we play church that you know if somebody, if somebody offends us at church we get upset and we storm out if you know that in churches the no-fault divorce has become as acceptable in many churches as in the world that you know we just don't tolerate anybody treating us badly that that you know you know I think sometimes we're more ready to quote some sort of cosmopolitan article saying you know 10 steps to spot an abuse abuses abusive narcissist or something that we are to read passages of scripture that say deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me that, that, that we have become we have become a, a club that is as much self-obsessed as any other club in the world that it's all about us and us being happy and us being comfortable and you know and we just do it with Christian clothing we just put on a little bit of Bible verse here and there. We, we just haven't learned what it means to deny ourselves. What does it mean to be a Christian? At the, at the barest level, we are saying by using the word Christian that we're a follower of Jesus. And Jesus says, if you want to come after me, you need to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. Who are we following? We're following somebody that as God ordained him for ministry, as the Holy Spirit empowered him, as God the Father from heaven declared him to be the one who was the Messiah and would fulfill the messianic ministry, was led out into the wilderness, did not eat anything to the point that he was about to drop down dead and he still refused to turn stones into the most basic of food that he would be able to remain alive because he trusted God enough to not manipulate his circumstances guys if somebody mildly irritates us we're prone to manipulate our circumstances to get the result that we want we have so little understanding of what it means to be a Christian. We have so little willingness to struggle and to suffer. 
We're not prepared to make sacrifices in our lives. We're not prepared to give up things. I, I know from, from seeing this just countless times when you try and counsel someone and you say, well, why don't you just not do this? And they'll say, well, I don't have to do that. That's not a sin. There's nothing wrong with me doing that. And I'm like, well, yeah, absolutely fine. It's not a sin to, to do X, Y, or whatever else it is you want to do necessarily. Maybe there are certain things that, you, that, you, you know, that aren't overtly sinful. But maybe you'd just live your life a bit better if you didn't have them, that in your life. The writer to Hebrews talks about obstacles and the sin that so easily entangles us. There are some things that are sinful and there are some things that are just hurdles, obstacles that get in our way. Jesus would not have sinned overtly by eating bread. But there is a trusting of the leading of the Spirit and the providence of God in the preparation for him to go into ministry, for him to do the things that God would have him do. I, I want to be careful how I say this. I don't want to um, make it too personal. <clears throat> but there's stuff in my life I've been through that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. There's things I've had to endure, <clears throat> often because of my own mistakes and my own sin, and other times through no fault of my own. But there's things in life I've been through that I would not, I literally would not wish on my worst enemy. But I could not be the pastor I am today, the person I am, the husband I am. I couldn't be who I am today unless I had been through those things. We live in a world where you want to be able to take a pill and have a six pack. You want to be able to read an article and know everything. We want the shortcut, we want the easy way, we want the easy route. If there's nothing else that you get from this passage today, get this. That there is no shortcut for Christians. And here's why. We are ridiculously selfish and we are ridiculously proud. And you don't get rid of that selfishness and pride by just simply unhooking it or unhinging it. It has to be beaten out of us. Christ didn't need to be baptized, as we saw a few weeks back before Christmas, in one sense, because he wasn't a sinner. But because those who were coming were through the baptism indicating <clears throat> a repentance and a turning from sin to another path, that Jesus is being baptized because that's the path that he is on as well. That's the direction that we are. T we weren't on that path. We were in a life of sin. And and we have to turn to go and serve God, to be obedient to God. Christ never had to turn. But he gets baptized because that is the same life, the same side, as it were, that he is declaring that he is on. Jesus doesn't have to be tested to have any selfishness or pride beaten out of him because he had none. But even he, just like with the baptism, even he goes through the process only to show who he is. And so Jesus is tested, and as we'll see next time as we go through, he doesn't fail, he doesn't compromise, he doesn't sin. Newsflash, you will. And I will. And we will fail again and again and again. 
And if you think that those of us who need to be shown our selfishness, who need to be shown our pride, who need to be shown our fragility and our brokenness and our sinfulness and our weaknesses, that we would cry out to him in repentance, that we would cry out to him for assistance and for help, that if we think that we won't be tested to be shown those things, then we are sorely mistaken. And this parallelism between the perfectness of Christ and the imperfection of us is seen so clearly here in the context in the idea of 40 days and nights. The 40 days here parallels the 40 years of Israel in the wilderness. And we have in verse 1 the reference that Jesus is in the wilderness as Israel before had been in the wilderness. The context, of course, in Matthew leads us back to chapter 2. Verses 13 through 15, we did that a few months ago. But we rem you remember that there was that quotation from Hosea, out of Egypt I have called my son. And we saw that as we looked at Hosea and we looked at Exodus and we went back into that whole context and we drew the dots and we, we went through the various layers, we saw that in Exodus chapter 4 and verse uh, 22, I think it is, that God calls Israel his firstborn son. And that this concept of sonship was picked up by the prophet Hosea because just as Israel the son went into the wilderness and was tempted, just as Israel the son failed God, just as Israel the son was rescued through an exodus, there will be another son, there will be another exodus, and there will be so much that goes along with that and one of the things is another wilderness and another tempting and another testing. And so chapter 4 here, when you see wilderness, when you see the word 40, you're having this connection that Matthew has already made with Israel. And what happened to Israel in the wilderness? Was it a huge success? <laughs> were, they, were they obedient to God? No, they were woefully disobedient. They failed again and again and again. They were found to be in sin. The wilderness experiences, and hopefully you guys will be joining us in the Bible reading plan this year, and we will in the coming months go through Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, and we'll see these stories again and again and again as we go through them. We'll see Korah's rebellion. We'll see the earth swallowing them up. We'll see fire coming down from heaven. We'll see serpents being allowed by God into the camp to bite them that they will die. We'll see them coming to the brink of the promised land and the spies going in. And we'll see them not trusting God and refusing to go and take the land. And then when God has rebuked them, we see them then saying, okay, we will go into the land. And God's saying, no, you don't get it now. And then being disobedient again as they go into the land that they've been told they now can't have. We'll talk so much more about that as we go through Matthew's Gospel because it sits throughout the Gospel, this parallel with Israel. And they failed and they failed and they failed and they failed. And so what we see in this, as Matthew is presenting it to us, is we see these two different sons of God. We see Israel, chosen by God, declared to be his beloved son, who fails in the wilderness, who is disobedient, who chooses wickedness and idolatry. And now we have another son of God, the beloved son in whom he is well pleased. We dealt, didn't we, as we went through that passage in the baptism, we dealt with Isaiah 42, we dealt with Genesis 22, we dealt with these passages, Psalm 2, we dealt with these passages that speak about the son, the prophesied son, the son that's going to have this new exodus, this new, um, this new um, response to God that is going to be great, the true redeemer that will redeem them, the one who will die for sins, the lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And so Israel 
is, is essentially being shown its failings through Christ who does not fail in the same situation. Now, all of this to say, <clears throat> we will, again, we'll deal with the specific temptations next time. But if we look again at the beginning, I want to skip to the end. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And then look at verse 11. After he has resisted Satan, the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. What do you think that ministry looked like? I can tell you one thing it looked like, food. <laughs> he got to eat. The food was brought by angels. And we'll talk about the, the, the irony of that and the significance of that in the context of the, the actual temptations next time. But I want you to see the double reference that contains this section to the devil. The devil here is very real. The Bible knows nothing of the devil as being some creature who is made up or invented or what have you. But the devil is very real. <clears throat> and the devil tempted Jesus. Now, I don't want to go on to too big a detour to talk about Satan and who he is. But let me just say a few things about him so that we have a biblical understanding of who he is. Firstly, he is not red with horns. I don't know where we get that from, but it's certainly not from the scripture. The scripture speaks of Satan as being an angelic being, probably cherubim or seraphim, which I consider to be pretty much parallel. We saw the seraphim in Isaiah 6 in the throne room of God. Six wings, two they covered their eyes, two they covered their feet, two they flew. They were probably serpent-like creatures. And this serpent creature was there in the garden. Satan was a real being who is created by God, who subsequently fell because all that God created was good. He doesn't, there's nothing in scripture to indicate he's red with horns. And he certainly doesn't go around poking people with a fork in hell because his eternal abode will be the lake of fire, which was made for him that he would suffer in it and not be the source of suffering for others. The only place where Satan is a source for suffering is upon this earth. Because once he is gone and he is in hell, then he will be there to suffer, not to produce suffering. There's all sorts of bizarre mythologies about the devil that we come across. Another one is this, which I really do have to mention. God and Satan are not like black and white, yin and yang, balancing out. God is sovereign. Everything that was created, he did create, including Satan. As children learn to sing from a very young age, he has the whole world in his hands. He is sovereign, he is in control of everything on this world and everything in the heavenly realms. Satan can only do what he is permitted to do by God. That isn't to say that he isn't without power. That isn't to say that he can't do certain things. That isn't to say that sometimes as Christians we do the opposite and we play down the significance of his power. The Bible is very, very clear that when the Antichrist comes, he will do amazing miracles as he is empowered to do by Satan. Somebody having a miracle happen, a genuine miracle, a genuine miracle of healing, something miraculous that happens that can't be explained, that just everybody goes, wow, that doesn't mean it's God. So Satan does have power. But he has no power other than what God allows him to have. Just as any other being of power, be it a governor, a president, be it an employer, be it anyone, the only power that any of us have is the power that God allows us to have. Why is it that Satan is allowed to tempt Jesus in the wilderness? 
Because God allows him to. When Jesus was born, Satan wasn't allowed to take him in the womb, as so many are. Satan wasn't allowed to take him when he was first born. But shortly afterwards, Satan tried to take him. And there was, as we saw in Matthew 2, the great slaughter of the innocents. Was that a work of Satan? That all of those babies were slaughtered? Absolutely it was a work of Satan. Is God still sovereign even then? Absolutely God is sovereign still even then. And we need to recognize the sovereignty of God even in the work of Satan. That even when evil and wickedness is done, that God can use it all for his glory. Whatever you go through, saints, no matter how cruel, no matter how painful, no matter how harsh, no matter how wicked, no matter how evil, no matter what suffering you have had to go through, God can and will use it all for his glory. It is the embracing of doctrine like that that so many Christians try and wriggle out of when in reality it's just a letting go of our sovereignty, a recognizing of his, and that's what trust looks like. And so Satan begins this section in verse 1. Satan ends this section in verse 11. And God is sovereign throughout this section. And as we go from this, and we'll talk more about it next time, because Satan is going to take in verse 8, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Can you note what Jesus doesn't do in response? He doesn't say, nor does he imply in any way, shape or form, don't be so silly, they're not your kingdoms, you don't get to do that. In fact, his response is just simply that he won't do that. Satan actually has a lot more power over the nations than we give him credit for. Does any one of us look at the world today, look at the powers of governments, look at the rules that they make, and think that Satan doesn't have his hand in them all? Because he certainly does. But what I see in verse 8 that I want to just, again, as we're doing this overview today, I want to draw our attention to, is the fact that there is somebody with kingdoms, that is Satan, who is offering kingdoms to another, that is Christ, and that there are two separate kingdoms. And that's why Matthew is so keen to point out this, this emphasis upon the kingdom of heaven. Chapter 3 and verse 2, John the Baptist said, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's all of these kingdoms in the world that Satan has to offer Jesus. And John has said just before, there's a kingdom that is now almost within reach. There's a kingdom within your grasp. There's a kingdom at hand. We get through this passage, and then as Jesus goes out into his ministry in verse 17 of chapter 4, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do you see how this temptation with the kingdoms being offered, is sandwiched either side by the preaching of the kingdom of heaven. One of the central themes of Matthew's gospel is the deciding of which kingdom you're going to be in. Satan has his own kingdom. That's really clear. Why don't we just go ahead a little bit to chapter 12.
In chapter 12, there's a a man who is demon-possessed in chapter 12, verse 22. And he was blind and mute as a result of that. Jesus casts the demon out of the man. And the crowd, verse 23, are astounded. Can this man really be the son of David? Now, we know what that means, don't we, son of David, now? We've dealt with that multiple times in the first two chapters already. That the son of David is the Messiah, is the promised messianic king. And why are they saying, can this be the son of David? Because he's cast out this demon. Because... We'll talk more about it when we get to chapter 12, but there's so many months away that we can, we can do a few spoilers. But uh, the Pharisees believed that any godly person, if God allowed them to, could cast out demons. It wasn't something that only the Messiah would do. But they had a way of doing it. If somebody was uh, possessed by a demon, you would say to that person, what is your name, demon? And if the demon told you their name, then you would interact with the demon. And that was how an exorcism would be performed. But sometimes when somebody was possessed by a demon, it would be such that that person was not able to speak. Now how do you cast a demon out when you can't communicate with it? The Pharisees themselves, in their own rabbinical writings declared that that kind of exorcism could only be done by the Messiah. They themselves taught that only the Messiah would be able to cast out a demon that caused a man to be mute. And that's what Jesus does. And so the crowds who've been taught this by the Pharisees say, surely this must be the son of David then. This has to be the Messiah. We were told that only the Messiah could do this. He's done it. He must be the Messiah. It's like pretty simple. One plus one equals two. So the Pharisees have to have an explanation. And their explanation in verse 24 is this. This man does not cast out demons except by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. And knowing their thoughts, he says to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. Any city or house divided against itself will not stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, is he divided against himself? How then (coughs) will his kingdom stand? Satan has a kingdom. He has a kingdom. He has control of nations. It is a kingdom with power. It is a kingdom with wealth. It is a kingdom with might. It is a kingdom of significance. It is a kingdom that is characterized by evil and lawlessness. These are words that come up again. Um, Just skipping ahead a little bit, chapter 13, verse 41. The Son of Man will send forth his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. You won't get to be in God's kingdom if there is lawlessness. They'll be thrown into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Go a little bit further ahead to verse 49. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous. Wickedness, lawlessness, these are things of Satan's kingdom and there is no place for them in the kingdom of heaven. That Jesus has been from the beginning determining that there are two ways. There is the kingdom of heaven that involves repentance and turning. You're going this way. You're living your life. You are the center of your life. And then there is a turning. And you turn and you shift. And you turn from your sin to Christ to live as he decides, as he determines, as he declares. He gets to decide what is right and wrong. He gets to decide what is good and evil. He gets to decide what is lawful and lawlessness. 
And you are committing yourself to walking his way and not the other way because the other way, Psalm 1, is a way that will perish and a way that leads to destruction. There are these two things. And so this is what I try to emphasize so much in chapter 3 that it was a month ago, we've had Christmas, so I make no apologies for emphasizing and repeating again. But in chapter 3, John the Baptist is saying to all of the Jews who have the scriptures, who have the Old Testament, who have the law of Moses, and have the Pharisaical system of teaching Moses, and he says to them, you have to repent. You have to turn. The Pharisees' number one doctrine was that all Israel have a share in the kingdom to come. How will you know if you're going to be in the kingdom? Are you a Jew? Are you circumcised? I guess you're going to be in the kingdom. Because all Israel have a share in the kingdom. And John says, no. You have to repent. The kingdom is available. It's at hand. It's ready. It's here. And there's a place for you. But you're going to have to repent. And in doing so, he is distinguishing his way, the way of the kingdom, from the Pharisee's way. And in doing that, as will become clear as we go through Matthew's gospel, he is declaring that the Pharisee's way is the way of perishing. It is the way that is outside of God's kingdom, and therefore it is a part of the kingdom of Satan. And John, and we talked about this at the time, but John implied that when he says to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He links them to the serpents and the snakes and those who have their heritage as part of the seed of Satan. There are only two kingdoms, two ways. I mean, there are many kingdoms in a sense, but they all come under the kingdom of Satan. And when we follow Jesus, that means that we are going to at times... Let me rephrase that. If we follow Jesus, that means that at all times we are going to have to deny ourselves. It means that we will go without wealth at times. It means at times we'll go without health. It means at times we'll go without food. We'll go without the things that we want, the things that we desire. Sometimes we'll go without things that would hurt us Sometimes we'll go without things that would help us. Sometimes there are desires that we have that are godly desires, and God will say no. We will be tested and tried, and Satan will always try and get us to live in harmony and accordance with his kingdom. It is marked by evil, it is marked by lawlessness, it is marked by us getting to live the way that we want to live that makes us comfortable and happy. Did you get that? That's, this, is, this is the crescendo of the sermon. This is what we've been building up to. The kingdom of Satan is the one that offers you the opportunity to live the way that you want, do the things you want to do, have the successes that you would like to have, and it is presented in a manifold number of ways. Whether it's a therapist telling you that you should be whole, whether it's somebody saying that you should manifest to the universe the things that you want, or whether it's someone quoting a Bible verse saying, no one should treat you that way. It all revolves around the same thing. It's all about you. You should be happy. You should be well. You should get what you want. You shouldn't be told what to do. You should be able to decide how you live. You should be able to decide what is right, what is wrong, and how everything should pan out. And that 
my friends, is how the majority of people in churches who profess the name of Christ, that is how they live because they're part of that kingdom. And the way of God is a narrow way because it involves us going into the wilderness, letting go with open palms and saying, I trust you, whatever Satan brings, whatever trials come, whatever is offered to me, I will not bow the knee, I will not compromise, I am yours and I will trust you and I will not bow to any other. That's what this passage is about. And Christ leads the way for us. And again and again, I'm going to ask you this question. As we go through Matthew's gospel, week after week after week, I'm going to ask you the same question. Are you going to follow Jesus? And where do you, what do you think that looks like? One last verse I want to look at in Matthew as we finish. Let's look at verse six, uh, chapter 16, rather. While well, we're talking about Satan. Chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. From the elders and chief priests, those religious leaders, part of the evil generation who are part of the kingdom of Satan, and scribes, and be killed, and raised up on the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid that we would ever do something like this. I suspect every one of us has done it in some way, shape, or form without even being aware. Rebuking him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. You are the son of David. Peter has just declared this. Verse 16. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Peter has declared faith in Christ, that he has had his eyes open spiritually. He's clearly saved. Only the Father could give him that understanding. He knows who Christ is. He is the declared one of God. And, and Peter says, You can't suffer. You, you just can't suffer. You can't die. That's not what is up for you. You get to rule and to reign. And Jesus turns and says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. We'll deal with all the details next time, but here's the big picture. You're going to be tested. Whose interests are you following? Are you setting your mind on your interests or on God's? Because that will declare ultimately which kingdom we're in. Peter was serving the kingdom of Satan even as a believer because he put man's interest ahead of God's. Most Christians haven't learned this lesson. They can read their Bible, sing their worship songs, go to church on Sunday, hang out with other Christians, do good deeds, do all sorts of stuff, but ultimately they still think that their interests are important, that their well-being is central. How dare you treat me this way? How dare you speak to me this way? That's the kingdom of Satan. So one last time, the next verse, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The way of Satan says, don't deny yourself, you deserve better. 
You should have good things. The way of Satan says you shouldn't have to go through that kind of suffering. The way of Satan says you do what you think is best, follow your heart. Can we this year commit to making Christianity look different than the kingdom of Satan? Can we ask ourselves again, have I counted the cost and am I prepared to follow Jesus? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this challenge before us. Israel was tempted and failed. Jesus was tempted and was victorious. He's given us his Holy Spirit that we, we might walk in victory too. Father, would you allow us to come out from our trials victorious, we pray, that you might be glorified through us. May we put to death our selfish desires, our selfish intent, that we should be happy, that we should feel full, that we should have what we want, that we should be satisfied, that we should have anything in this life. May it burn. May we deny ourselves. May we take up our cross. And may we follow the one who hungered. Follow the one who suffered. Follow the one who died. Follow the one who lived for your glory and not his own comfort. Amen.